Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturring in the world. Welcome to Eco SY. Today, we're going to sit down with Bill Metcalf, who's Director of Information Systems at Global Process Automation. And he's going to help us understand about OT networks. So we're going to break down industrial networks for our listeners. And Bill, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Chris. Happy to be here. Well, we're glad to have you, sir, and looking forward to all the, the knowledge that you're going to bring our listeners. So maybe you can start us off with just a top-level explanation of what it means when you hear that term, OT. Okay, so OT typically refers to operational technology. And, and basically, OT is the infrastructure. It's what our manufacturing systems, our industrial control systems are built on. Typically, uh, a lot of people will confuse it with IT because there's a lot of networks and switches and things of that nature involved there. But kind of the, the true determining factor about OT is the computers and the systems and the networks that interact with the physical world. So unlike IT, where we're about sharing files and communicating bank information and things like that, in the OT environment, we're actually talking about things that interact with the physical world. You know, whether it's conveyor belts, manufacturing lines, whatever. Okay, so that's a very good breakdown for us. And we, we hear it, it does get confusing a lot of times when we're talking about OT and IT. And, and so thanks for breaking that line uh, for us to, to explain it further for our listeners. And we a lot of times when we hear OT, we hear things like switches, routers, VLANs. These can be confusing terms. Maybe can you break some of those down for our listeners? Well, I'll, uh, I'll try. Let's see what we come up with. So basically, uh, switchers and routers are the devices that, that manage exchange of data, right? So as uh, the PLC talks to IO in the field or the HMI is uh, getting or receiving uh, data from the PLC, typically that goes through a switch. And the switch has the, the capability of managing either what they call a, a LAN or local area network or it can be part of the, the mill-wide network. A lot of times uh, we hear things like network segmentation and things like that, and switches give us that ability to do that. Typically, in a managed switch, we will break down into these local area networks, and that typically falls down to process areas within the facility, right? And so if you think of the, the hundreds of thousands of devices that are in a single plant, by going to a local area network method, we're kind of breaking those up into, into logical chunks so that they're smaller, they're easy to manage. If we think about manufacturing, timing is critical. If it's something that is uh, complex as monitoring, you know, fuel in a boiler or steam pressures, or maybe it's the robots, the way that they interact with, you know, the conveyor and, and loading and stacking boxes, things like that. A matter of a second or two in delay is a problem. So, so typically in an industrial network, time is everything. And so speed is of the essence in these. And so by breaking them down into these smaller groups or the, these local area networks, that gives us the ability to just focus on that local communications. And when we do that, so now we've got all these little local area networks or these separate process areas, if you will, that are all running together. Router basically bridges those all into a single network. And so that can be used for supplying data to the business unit or maybe exchanging data from one process area to the other. So if you think about the switches, that that collection or that local communications within the process area, and then anything that has to leave that process area, there's typically a router that sits there that facilitates moving data from one local area to another or up to the, the wide area network. Does that make sense? That does. That, that helps a lot. So you mentioned a bridge for the router. That's a, is that a good analogy for our listeners to kind of think of when they hear that term? Yeah. So, so bridge is maybe a little older term. Routers now um, typically run based off of TCP IP 
um, where bridge is more at the layer two level of the network. Uh, without getting too deep into it, a bridge is more of a hardware platform to, to exchange data from one area to the other. Most all of your, your current networks use a router that uses TCP IP to manage that communications from one network to the other. Okay, that, that definitely helps. Now, a lot of times inside industrial plants, we, we see different types of cables and connectors. So what are different types of media that you would typically see in an OT network? Okay, so the OT network, depending on the systems you have, a lot of the OT network didn't start out natively as Ethernet. So there may be proprietary protocols. Um, there may be things like Profibus, Data Highway Plus, uh, MMS. Some of these are serial protocols. Some of them use special cabling and things like that. Most of your more modern control systems now are moving to Ethernet. And so there you've got the typical CAT6 cable that you see at your house, you know, has looks like a telephone connector on each end. You may have fiber optic cable when you're going long distances. Fiber optics uh, is better for that. Usually a, a copper cable is limited to 300 meters. Fiber optic cable can go a mile, mile and a half without losing integrity of their, their data. So, you know, like I say, you've got the standard Ethernet and then you'll have proprietary cables that uh, you may see out there on the plant floor. Like I say, usually the proprietary cables are maybe a little older protocol. And, and like I said, I think just about all of the OEMs are, are either have completely adapted or in the process of adapting at least their new lines. They may keep some backwards compatibility, um, but I think for the most part, folks are moving to the standard CAT5, CAT6. And there are some industrial Ethernet cables that are shielded. They have a little different connector on them, but they're, they're also Ethernet. Now, with those types of cables and connectors for the industrial, would they, is that what you recommend, particularly in a process type environment? Yeah. So when we think about OT, there's different environments within OT. If you think about in a control room in an MCC where there's a lot of electrical noise, you may need to go with like a shielded cable or more of an industrial type of Ethernet cable. If you are talking about maybe in control rooms or if you've gone to kind of a data center model where you've got a area that is designated for all of your servers and everything around, you may not need to do as much on that shielded environment. And I also have customers who have corrosive environments. And so there are specific connectors and specific cable that could be used in those corrosive environments to, to keep that copper from from corroding and, and giving you intermittent problems, things like that. Right. So I guess you really need to take in consideration the environment that the, the media is going to be in, the connectors and things like that, and make the, the best educated, you know, decision of, you know, off of that environment itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, now we, we've had a couple of guests and, and we've talked about this a few times. I feel like I've been on some calls recently too, just, you know, outside of eco ask why. And the, Topic of managed versus unmanaged switches comes up, and it often is confused. So maybe you can give a good overview of this for our listeners, because I know this this is something that that's tripped me up in the past, and uh, I think it, just a good explanation would really help here, Bill. Okay, well, hopefully, hopefully, I can give you a good explanation. You know, at, at the very high level, it, it's just what it seems. So, so managed switches are just that; they give you the ability to manage on a port by port in the switch who talks to whom and you can actually run multiple uh, networks we talked earlier about local area network versus wide area network and a managed switch gives you that ability to adjust your ports and adjust your configurations to match what your facility needs an unmanaged switch is just that it, it is just a flat switch that you can plug devices in and they will communicate. Kind of one of the limitations of that is, is if we think about kind of that mixed network where we have the wide area network and the local area network kind of in the same switch, you think about the work the switch has to do. If it's just local area traffic, it's, it's managing that. If it's wide area traffic, you're dealing with the whole mill, everybody trying to communicate and, and, and the switch trying to keep up with that. So in, in the case of an unmanaged switch, 
you probably do not want to put it in that mixed environment. You probably want to stay with the managed switch there so that you can kind of separate the, the, those networks and have some isolation there. Where an unmanaged switch is, is kind of like the perfect fit is if you think, you know, we said a lot of the uh, manufacturers are moving to Ethernet, industrial Ethernet for like I.O. and things like that. If it is a localized, isolated network and everybody that is on that network should be able to talk to everybody else and, and it's isolated away from all of the traffic that's going on plant wide. That's kind of that ideal fit or ideal situation to put in that unmanaged switch. Okay. Then does cost ever factor into these decisions, Bill? I mean, it sounds like to me the managed would be the typically the way to go, but I'm just curious on some other factors here and, and, and cost may be one, but just like your take. So yeah, definitely cost is a consideration to take. Typically the unmanaged switches are maybe half the cost of a managed switch, you know, depending on which ones you pick and the number of ports and everything. So the unmanaged switch is more cost effective. There, there are, again, specific situations where that unmanaged switch makes sense. One of the things that, that I really like about managed switches outside of the ability to, to be able to, to granularly control my network traffic is the managed switch also usually has diagnostics kind of built into them. And so there's logging and there's a ton of troubleshooting and diagnostics information that's available in a managed switch that's not in an unmanaged switch. Again, you know, I'm, I'm more of the techie guy. I like to dig down into that. Probably, realistically speaking, the average user is not doing that. So if you've got those small little isolated silos of networking, save the money and go with an unmanaged switch. No doubt. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for... You definitely cleared air for me, and I'm sure you did for a lot of our listeners, too. And we oftentimes, you, you brought it up earlier when you are talking about Ethernet and Profibus. We hear things about industrial protocols. For our new listeners who are maybe new to OT, what should they know about those protocols that, to kind of give them a good foundation? Well, um, <laughs> there's a lot of things to know about industrial protocols. Probably the biggest concern, and when I'm having conversations with customers, the first thing you go to is usually industrial protocols are not very secure. So if we think about securing our networks and we think about uh, cybersecurity around the OT environment, typically industrial protocols are not encrypted. They're not password protected. They say that the priorities, if you're developing a OT application, it's designed for speed over confidentiality where if we're talking about a protocol that works in the business environment, it's designed to be secured. It's designed to run in that uh, corporate enterprise environment. So from a security standpoint, industrial protocols are designed for speed over confidentiality. Also, a lot of times the industrial protocols, there's a lot more flexibility around redundancy. If you think about uh, the business need, if if the network going to the plant manager's office goes down, it's probably a bad day for the IT guy that's got to go out and fix it. But at the end of the day, the plant's still running and they're still making product. When we go and we think about a switch that's running a production line, if it goes down, the company's losing literally thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars for, the, for that downtime event. So there's a lot of specific industrial uh, redundancy protocols and everyone's a little different. Everyone has specific advantages, disadvantages, configuration requirements, that kind of thing. Typically, if you're not familiar with these, you need to go to your supplier and explain to them kind of what your needs, what your concerns are, or an integrator and, and you know, have them kind of walk you through kind of what those pluses and minuses are. But uh, other than that, a lot of it is, is common sense, if you will. Absolutely. Now, when you were you were mentioning that between the IT and OT, you know, a bad day for the plant manager impacts the, the IT guy more than the OT guy. You know, I've heard I've heard of this in the past, and I think maybe this place here, the, the CIA triad, is that – factor in for decision-making or maybe just understanding the priorities between IT and OT? Here you're going to trip me up on something, aren't you? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, typically I, the way I well, the way I learned and it was it was given to me was for the IT world, it's the CIA, which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Where OT availability is the lead, availability and you know safety's mixed in there, and then integrity, then confidentiality. Unfortunately, with with all of this stuff, everything is acronyms, right? And and sometimes it's uh, easy to get your acronyms confused. I always uh, I always relate that that triangle. Actually, there's um, SANS Institute has this infographic uh, of that, and, and that's kind of how I keep it straight, if you will. That's great. We'll research that, and this will we'll have that as a a link for our listeners to be able to go check that out. So, and we hear about topology too, and I know this could go anywhere, but from a, just a high level, the one-on-one, you know, can you explain uh, network topology for our listeners? Yeah. So, so topology is one of these conversations that, that any network guy, you know, he's, he's going to focus in on that. And, you know, at the very high level, topology is the way that switches and systems, you know, it's the infrastructure, it's how the switches tie together. And then you can get down into detail about different uh, ways to segment traffic, to deal with workloads and things like that. Oftentimes, we look at network topology if we're thinking about redundancy and fault tolerance systems. It's understanding how each switch talks to the next switch. And I know typically, like if we're doing an assessment or an evaluation, we like to even represent in our topology the paths that the, the interconnecting cables go, you know, usually in, a, in an industrial environment, you'll have a series of control rooms and then there'll be fiber optic cable that runs between the control rooms. And we can use that topology diagram to make sure that we don't have that single point of failure type of thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a way to diagram out or graphically represent how things are physically connected um, out in the real world. There you go. That was a great explanation. Thank you so much for that, Bill. And another thing we we hear and we see in, in the, the OT networks are things like patch panels, hubs, repeaters. There are a few more terms. Can, can you kind of break those down? <laughs> okay. Well, usually, um, I, sometimes I kind of tend to cringe a little bit when I hear hub, hubs and repeaters and, 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 and patch panels, but let's take a look at each one of them. So hub is kind of the, the, the forerunner of a switch. So it works or looks very similar. It's got a series of ports and you plug your devices in and the devices communicate. In a hub, I guess the best way to describe it is it's like communicating with a bullhorn. So if somebody's talking through that hub on the network, everybody listens even if they're not part of the conversation, right? In a switch, a switch is more of a point-to-point type of, uh, of scenario where if computer A is talking to computer B, the switch kind of keeps that traffic between computer A and computer B, and the rest of the, the connected devices don't necessarily have to listen to that conversation. In a hub, everybody hears everything, sees everything that goes out on the network. So typically... Hubs are legacy. Uh, At this point, I don't even know if you can go out and buy a hub anymore. I'm sure there's probably somebody out there that offers them. But typically, if you're going to buy one, you want to buy a switch so that you can be more direct with your with your communications. If we look at the term for repeaters, repeaters, again, is kind of a throwback, if you will. Back in the day, we know like with copper cable, we can go 300 meters. That's that's kind of that physical limit. If we have to extend beyond that, uh, we can add a repeater into the line to basically boost the signal to carry it further. In today's technology, the advances in fiber optics and and things like that, nobody really uses repeaters anymore. It's just as easy to run a run of fiber and plug it into a switch or, you know, if they need a media converter, fiber is usually, if you're going distance, is a much better solution than the repeater. And then patch panels are, it's kind of like the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So, so patch panels are this awesome tool to manage your cables and cabinets and things like that. And that in and of itself is, is awesome. And if you're in 
environments like the data center and things like that. That's a perfect use case. If you get into patch panels out in like MCCs and things like that, where temperatures may be not regulated and that kind of thing, if you look at the way the, the cable connects into a patch panel, uh, kind of on the back side of the panel, basically there are little metal V's that the wire gets pressed down into, so it kind of strips the wire, and it's just kind of a friction type of connection. And so if you're in these non-regulated temperature environments, things like that, as they heat and they cool and they heat and they cool, those joints tend to expand and contract. If you're running a uh, pulp mill in a paper mill or something like that, where maybe it's a little corrosive in there, you start getting corrosion in there and you start having intermittent problems, uh, you know, disconnects or delayed data errors, that kind of thing. So patch panels in the right environment are an awesome tool for cable management. Realistically speaking, if you're in a, you know, in an area where, you're going to have a lot of temperature fluctuations. It's potentially a corrosive environment, that kind of thing. There are much better connectors that just go straight on the cable, and then the cable would go directly into, into your end device. Um, so, like I say, on the patch panels, I always recommend stay away from those in, in, in unregulated areas. Very good. Thank you so much, Bill. I mean, that was Great, great points and all that stuff. You really broke down. You not seeing repeaters. The I like the analogy of the the uh, hub being a bullhorn, you know, and and just being careful where you use those patch panels at in industry. And you know, we we call it eco ask why for a reason. We like to get to the why, you know. So why would having a general understanding of OT networks be important for any level of personnel that works inside of an industrial manufacturing plant? Well, I think having at least a, a brief foundation of what's going on. Again, a lot of these networks, it's the foundation. It is the infrastructure on the way that your manufacturing process works. So if nothing else, to be able to understand troubleshoot, if I have a problem, being able to at least know where the network lies, you know, what components of data flow the network affects as opposed to the field wiring out to a specific transmitter or something like that. So having even even a basic understanding helps you in troubleshooting as more and more companies are going to um, training for things like cybersecurity and things like that, understanding how devices are connected together. And you couple that with like awareness training and things like that. You start to see where, well, if I am maybe accessing the internet from an HMI, how that could impact on a controller or you know some Ethernet I/O in the field. So at least at least understanding what your environment is and how it all works and talks together. Absolutely, no doubt. And, and thank you so much, Bill. I mean, you've really helped tie together so many of these different variables inside of OT network. I know you brought a lot of value, and I really appreciate you taking the time to break this down for us to the level that you did. So really enjoyed this conversation, Bill. Well, thank you. You know, I always try to say when it comes to OT environments, some of it, it's black box, it's magic. And the only way that we're going to understand it and improve on it is ask a question and have a discussion. And, and I think it's great that you guys are doing this series and doing just that, you know, you're asking questions, you're having a conversation about the different components within OT. I think as a whole, as a community, um, it's only going to help us do better in the future. No doubt. And, and for us, too, it's connecting the world you know, that we that we engage with to the experts like yourself. That That's, you know, the value. I and mean, it's so important just so that they know that, you know, you guys and you know you this is your world this is what you live in if i want to get better at it i may want to listen to guys like that so uh, i i can't express enough how how grateful i am and, and thank you so much for your time today thank you for listening to eco ask why this show is supported ad free by electrical equipment company eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.